set up to with the crew of uh, Lester here. <laughs> so uh, we are uh, thinking if of this. Uh, Uh, thanks uh, a lot, David. Thanks a lot for having me here. I hope the volume is good. Okay, I think I should start by uh, apologizing for a few things. So yeah, obviously I'm uh, I'm not Fernando. So everyone who was expecting Fernando, uh, too bad. At least he's featured as a as a as a. <laughs> we gained that. We definitely gained that. Um <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, and then. Um, this might also be a, a bit of a uh, mathematical talk, uh, but I think the, the topic is kind of, uh, of broad interest because I'm going to talk about the mathematical properties of, of quantum entropy, okay? And yeah, as mentioned, this is joint work uh, with uh, Fernando Omar, who is also here, and uh, uh, Christo Fierche, David Sutter, and uh, Marco uh, Thomas Michel. And it's based on a couple of papers um, that are kind of semi-recent. But when I was asked by, by David to give this talk, I didn't have time to prepare something completely new, um, so I apologize to everyone who saw this talk before. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so let's start with a little bit of, of motivation. Um, <coughs> so I want to talk about entropy, in particular about uh, quantum entropy, and this is of course uh, defined by by von Neumann in, in 1927, and it's just given by minus the trace of rho a log rho a, where rho a is any um, let's say finite dimensional uh, a quantum state. And uh, so one interesting comment here is that the uh, this is actually uh, 20 years before the works of, of Shannon, right, in classical information theory. So in some sense, a quantum entropy was considered before um, classical entropy. Okay? Uh, now, uh, for classical entropy, we understand it very well, at least from a, from a mathematical viewpoint. <coughs> and uh, yeah, we know how to work with it, we know how to handle it, and uh, derive uh, interesting properties. However, for, for, for quantum systems, <coughs> this is a little uh, less clear. So if we, if we stick to one system, then it's kind of fine because everything follows from, from the classical theory. But if we look at multipartite quantum systems, uh, of course, they be, uh, can become uh, entangled. Okay? They can become uh, correlated and correlate in a stronger way than, than classical systems. And this, mathematically, well, this leads to uh, the non commutativity of the, the underlying uh, quantum states. So if you look at the reduced states, for example, of here on this system, here on AB and DEB, so if, if you have an overlap in these subsystems, then the, the, the reduced quantum state, they won't commute. Okay? And this makes things uh, very, very difficult to, to handle if we, when we want to talk about a quantum entropy, for example. Okay? And so the thing is, basically everything we know about quantum entropy uh, can be deduced from, from one identity, from one inequality, uh, the so-called uh, strong uh, subadditivity by, by Lieb and Ruskind. And what, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us if we have a tripartite state, ABC, then if we look at the sum of the entropy of AB and BC, then this is never smaller than the entropy of the whole state uh, plus the entropy of the intersection of these two sets. Okay? Um, so this is a very uh, non-trivial inequality to show exactly uh, because these different subsystems uh, can be entangled and then we have a non-commutativity of the reduced states that we have to handle. Okay? <coughs> However, of course, uh, the nice thing is now <coughs> If we can show an entropy inequality to hold in the quantum setting as well, then this will be a very um, useful tool. Why? Well, uh, because it gives us um, bounds or constraints on, on the multipartite entanglement structure, right? It, uh, so this identity here, this tells us that we have a tripartite state. It will always have this property, okay? So this really tells us about something about the structure uh, of the underlying state, okay? So, so it's hard to prove identities for the quantum case for the entropy, um, but if we have one, it's 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 very useful. Let's let's say that, and and then of course entropy shows up in all kinds of, of disciplines, right? And even in disciplines that are a priori not not connected. Okay, you can think of statistical mechanics or, or thermodynamics, information theory, or or even computer science, where it's often more of a like a proof tool because it has so ni so nice mathematical properties. We, we use entropy as a as a proof tool. Okay, so if you understand this, this mathematical structure, if you understand what uh, properties of entropy not only hold in the classical case, but in the quantum case, um, this was, will tell us a lot and will be useful for, for many applications. Okay, so that's kind of my, my motivation slide. I hope I could convince you. And uh, now what are we going to do? Well, I want to argue that if we really want to understand quantum entropy, what, what we have to understand are actually so-called uh, matrix trace inequalities. 
Okay, so this is really at the at the core of of the problem, uh, if you want. And so, what are uh, matrix uh, trace inequalities? Well, we all know how to to calculate with 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 numbers. Um, but if we have we have matrices, so let's say we have two uh, Hermitian, for example, uh, matrices uh, H1, H2. Then then if when they don't commute, there are many identities that do no longer hold. Okay, and, and in matrix analysis, people study what what still holds, what type of identities still work for. Um, for for matrices and <coughs> so here is an example okay so if we take the the product of the exponential of h1 times the exponential of h2 um, so by the way all these matrix functions can just be defined via the, the spectral decomposition of the the operator or the matrix it's applied to to make this clear okay so then uh, of course classically this is just going to be the same as the exponential of h1 plus h2 right uh, but now it turns out that well since H1, H2 in general, they don't compute, so this identity no longer holds. But uh, but luckily we have this uh, Baker-Campbell uh, Hausdorff formula that probably many of you have uh, have seen before. So we have to add all kinds of fudge terms here. Okay, and you might hope they're small, maybe they are, maybe may maybe they're not. But they're they're, th they're these commutators, right? So that's just a commutator between H1 and H2. And okay, this is very nice identity, Baker-Campbell Hausdorff. But then we might hope that if we put a trace around this. Okay, so if we put a trace around, then of course we make this a scalar quantity again. And then we, mi we might hope, okay, maybe then we can recover the classical identities that we usually use. And uh, it turns out uh, w we cannot, but we can show uh, something slightly weaker, namely this uh, so-called golden Thompson inequality, okay? We can show that there is still a, a lower bound if we put a trace around. And this is really wha what's called a, a matrix uh, trace inequality. And so, as you can see here, very often these inequalities are actually equalities in the commutative case and, and are very trivial, if you want. But in this non-commutative case, this is it's hard to show. It's very non-elementary to show. And this is what is it's an example of a matrix trace. Okay, so now why is this connected to, um, to, to entropy? Okay, um, so first of all, um, the strong subadditivity I had on the, on the last slide, okay, where this identity where we could um, kind of deduce all the other mathematical properties of, of uh, entropy. Um, this was proven by, by, by Lieb and Roskai, and, and it was proven uh, by Lieb, and it was actually, um, if you look at the original proof, it was really using a, a matrix trace inequality, okay? But now the thing is, um, we not only have two matrices, but we, we have to handle multi, multiple matrices, okay? So that's why we need these uh, multivariate trace inequalities. And, and if you want, you can understand this uh, in, the, in the sense that we have three parties, right? We look at tripartite states for the strong subadditivity, remember? Row A, B, C. And so we have multiple subsystems, and that's why these, these trace inequalities with only two matrices are not enough. We really need multivariate trace inequalities to, to understand multipartite quantum systems, or the entropy of multipartite quantum systems. Okay, and now, um, so we're coming back to this later in the talk, but I'm uh, just going to tell you now that this original proof by, by, by Lieb and Ruskai, it, it, it was using this this inequality, okay? So now what is this? So, so it's a kind of a golden Thompson inequality. So if you look at the right-hand side here, right? So you just have the sum of, of three Hermitian matrices now, okay? And <coughs> then the question is, okay, maybe we can do a similar upper bound as this one over here. Uh, and this uh, uh, turns out to be wrong. So if you just put X H1 times X H2 times X H3, this is obviously wrong because the resulting matrix doesn't necessarily have to be positive anymore, but you can do some more clever sandwiching of the three terms, uh, but it, it still turns out to be wrong, okay? So you really have to come up with this kind of weird expression, um, maybe, such that you can prove a similar uh, upper bound holds. And now if you look at this expression, so first of all, if H1 and H2 and H3 commute, then this will just collapse to the usual thing, okay? Uh, so why is that? Well, if they commute, you can take these two the terms together, okay, and then you can take the integral inside just around this, these two terms that are not together. So, so you look at this integral, and if you, okay, this is an elementary exercise to show that in, in this integral is actually just gives you an x. So then you just get x page 1 times x page 2 times x page 3, okay? So you recover the, 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 the commutative case. But now in the non-commutative case, you really have to kind of write it in this, in this weird way, okay? So you can understand, if you want, these, these lambda terms here. So by the way, the lambda should just be a lambda times identity matrix, okay? So it's like a matrix-valued lambda. 
Um, so if you, if you look at those terms, uh, it's like a, a way of, uh, a non-commutative way of, of, of multiplying with this matrix X of H3, right? Because in the decommutative case, it would just be taking, multiplying with X of H3, right? But now we do this sandwich way of multiplying. So you can already see that there's a very non-trivial dynamics uh, uh, going on here. And again, this is really what is needed to understand quantum entropy for multiparticles. Yes. So that's the thing, I don't. So this holds generally, and also it, I wouldn't know how to derive it from the baker campbell Hausdorff. So this is, um, well, there are various ways, by, by now we know various, uh, I'm also going to talk about this, various ways how, how to derive this, but this really holds for general matrices. This is the point, yes. Thanks for the question. Okay, so what do I want to do? Just a, a very quick quick overview, and uh, I understand I have 55 minutes, so we'll see how, how much of the proofs we'll do. Um, but I want to start from uh, from scratch, basically, so I would like to, to develop the the concept of entropy uh, starting from, from the classical case, from the commutative case. Okay? And then I want to actually talk about entropy inequalities, and this will uh, naturally lead us to the study of multivariate trace inequalities, like the one by, by Lieb we had on the uh, on the last uh, last slide, and then uh, yeah, we have we have we have the proofs and maybe some some outlook with with, with open uh, questions around all of this. Good, um, yes. So as promised, let's start with classical entropy. So uh, entropy for classical systems, if we have a, a random variable x uh, with a probability distribution p x, right? Then the Shannon entropy is just defined as as minus sum over x p x log p x, and then okay, so x is zero, which is use this additional uh, definition to take care of the, the support conditions. And so uh, you can either define these kind of in an operational way, as Shannon did, if you, you look at information theory, um, but I also put the, the, the name of Reni here because he, he came up kind of with an axiomatic approach where you would say you want entropy to be in, well, an abstract function and it should fulfill some nice mathematical identities and then he kind of singles out uh, this entropy as the the, this function as the unique measure for entropy. Okay. Um, uh, in any case, so this is now again for, for one system, okay, like one random variable. Now if we want to go to, to multipartite systems, um, there's actually a, a very convenient um, kind of parent quantity called relative entropy or, or uh, kullback leibler divergence, um, where we just look at the entropy of P with respect to some other, maybe even not normalized distribution Q. Okay. So you just take this sum over x, px, log, and then px over qx, okay? So this is a kind of parent quantity, so why is that? Well, one way to see why, why this is a parent quantity is if we now look at this uh, strong subadditivity that we had before, of course now for the classical case, um, then okay, so we had, uh, so now not written in ABC, right, but in x, y, c, um, so we had that the sum of the, the entropy of the reduced state is never smaller than the entropy of the whole system plus the entropy of the intersection, and we can equivalently write this um, as a, an inequality in, in terms of relative entropy. Okay, you can see, um, we can just, okay, this is an elementary rewriting, okay, but these two um, inequalities are, are, are actually equivalent where the ux is just a, it's a uniform distribution. Okay, uh, <coughs> and as you can see, so here on the left hand side, there are the three systems, x, y, c, right? And on the right hand side, the c system is gone. Okay, so if we forget about the c system, uh, this relative entropy never never increases, and this is actually there you go. Uh, this is actually um, the, the the most important property of of entropy, in particular if we look at multipartite systems. This is the so-called the monotonicity of the relative entropy. Okay, so one can state it a bit mo more generally than just forgetting about the system, uh, namely if we apply um, some uh, stochastic matrix n on on both of the the, the distributions uh, p and q, then it the entropy uh, can never never go up. And this is really the, uh, the basic uh, property of, of, of entropy, okay? So this is about basically what we have, very brief, but what we have in the classical setting. Now I want to uh, extend this to the quantum setting, okay? So I want to kind of reproduce all of these things. And uh, well, uh, as I already had on, on, on the board, uh, the, the quantum entropy or the von Neumann entropy uh, is uh, defined in the same way um, as before, as man has uh, the trace of rho log rho, where rho is now a, a quantum state, or 
yeah, which is just a positive semi-definite uh, operator on, on, on some, let's say, finite dimensional uh, in the product space. And now uh, the, the nice thing about this definition is I, I can think of it as going into the, the eigenbasis of our operator rho a and just apply the classical definition. Okay? So the, 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 the lambda x here are supposed to be the, uh, the eigendistribution of, of the, the state rho a. And then I, if I just go to the eigenbasis, if I go to the right basis, I basically have a classical quantity. Okay? So in that sense, this extension from classical to quantum is kind of uh, straightforward. Um, okay. So now this was for one system, so let's uh, do the same for, for multipart that system. And let's, let's not do it for, for all the quantities separately, but let's do it for this parent quantity, namely this, this relative entropy, right? Um, so now, however, now we have these two operators, right? Rho and sigma, for example, two quantum states. Uh, and now, the problem is those operators won't commute in general, so they will not, there will not be a common eigenbasis, right? So the question is, if we want to do a similar thing and think of this as a classical quantity, in, in what basis do we go? Okay? And okay, we can say, well, let's just go to the, uh, in some sense, best possible basis. Okay? Um, so we can just say we measure the rho and the sigma, and then we look at the post measurement probability distribution, okay? and then we apply the classical definition from before. So this is again now just the Kullback lab, the divergence of this. Distri probability distribution versus this probability distribution. And we can actually do this a bit more generally. We can say, okay, instead of just measuring in a basis, we can just uh, collect a statistic, uh, some s classical statistics in general, so we can apply general uh, measurements, so just quantum channels which have a, a classical output system, or, well, in, in this algebraic way of phrasing it, um, the output is a it's a commutative subalgebra. Okay, so this quantity was uh, was considered by by Donald as as a possible uh, uh, extension of of relative entropy to the quantum setting, and and sometimes it's called uh, commutative relative entropy. Um, so this is all nice, um, but now if you look at this a little more closely, okay, it's not clear that this is the right thing to do. So there are many other um, uh, things that 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 you could come up with. So if you look back at the at the this classical definition where we have this p x log p x over uh, over Qx, okay, now if we um, replace the Px with an operator rho and the Qx with an operator uh, sigma, uh, there are various ways, various things we can do. Well, okay, so it becomes a bit unclear what it means to, to divide uh, by a matrix here, right? Um, but for example, we can, we can put just uh, the, the log, right? We can split up this log and then we get the, this, um, this definition which goes back to, to Umegaki where we just put trace of rho log rho minus log sigma. Um, but we could also do other things. So I, I, I singled out, uh, I mean, there are infinitely many things you can do, but I, I singled out another definition, which is due to Belavkin and, and Stasievsky, uh, where we just um, order uh, these operators a little differently. And now again, because these are matrices, th these definitions are a priori not equal, right? I mean, classically, we could just split up the, uh, the logarithms, but now in, in the quantum case, we, uh, we, we cannot in general. Okay, and now, <coughs> okay, so we have all these definitions now. Uh, of course, we would w uh, want these definitions to be behave nicely, right? So in particular, um, we want to have uh, them this fundamental property, namely this monotonicity of relative entropy. Um, now it turns out one can actually show this monotonicity uh, for all the definitions, okay? So that's not necessarily helping us. So it's easy to see that for this commutative relative entropy, this basically follows from the, the monotonicity of the classical definition. And uh, so those two identities are, are much more uh, non-trivial. So now this, this just says that any, any uh, quantum operation we apply, so for example, it could be a partial trace, but it can be really any, any quantum channel, the, the relative entropy distance should not, um, should not go up. And, and now um, maybe um, just a, a little side comment for the expert here. So this, defini uh, this definition here of Belavkin, so the trace is cyclic. So, so you can put a, a row one half from here over here, and then this function is actually even an uh, operator monotone uh, under, under quantum channels. So you don't even need to put a trace to have this property. So you can really look at operator valued entropies as well if you, if you want. But anyway, we're not, we're not, uh, not going to do that. So now we have these definitions and now, okay, so this is not very unique, right? We have all these definitions. Okay, maybe they're the same, maybe they're not. Which one should we use? So uh, let me tell you um, what one uh, can show. Well, one can show that these three definitions they're only the same if and only if 
the operator's commute. Okay, so these three definitions I gave you, they're really different uh, in general, and moreover, they're ordered. Okay, so this is the commutative relative entropy, this is this Umegaki definition, and this is Belavkin uh, Stasiewski um, definition. And, and moreover, one can even show um, that if we asked for this uh, monotonicity property, then this is actually the, the smallest possible non commutative extension of the classical quantity. And this is the largest possible extension of the non-commutative quantity. Okay, so that's why I gave you these two examples, the commutative and the belavkin sasievsky because it's the smallest and, and the biggest that we, we can do. And, and of course, okay, so this D is just somewhere in the middle. And uh, yeah, I mean, this also just uh, a, a side uh, a comment here, maybe uh, this would be better for, for next week when talk about the convexity a lot. Um, so, but uh, one easy way to see, one very useful tool, and one easy way to see um, this ordering is, is by using so-called uh, variational formulas, or in particular, what we have, to, I mean, basically these are Legendre transformations of the quantities uh, itself. And so, okay, so let's lo look at the first uh, expression just very quickly. So, so what's nice here is, okay, we have to all om optimize over all these omegas, but, but one thing that's nice is that here we have a term that only depends on rho, and this one only on sigma. So it kind of separates the rows and the sigma. So it's a very powerful representation of the quantity. Um, uh, also because you remember in the definition of this quantity, we had to optimize overall measurement statistics, right? So one can kind of uh, conveniently capture this by this formula. And then a similar thing I is possible for, for this Umegaki definition. And uh, for the Belavkin, things are actually a bit, a bit, uh, a bit more more complicated. Um, but l let me just li leave it at that here. Uh, but now, once we have that, we can actually use this golden Thompson inequality from before. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. So I'll. Uh, yeah, in the next slide, basically. I mean, the point is, of course, this is kind of a mathematical axiomatic approach to things, right? And this doesn't uh, single out any quantity, basically. I mean, it singles out those three, basically. But then, you know, okay, which one is going to be useful, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for keeping it so so abstract um, uh, at the beginning. Uh, we're we're going to use all of that later for this deriving entropy inequalities and stuff. But, uh, yes, good question. Very good question. Okay, so, so, so let me speed up here a bit. So the point is now, once we have these variational expressions, it's not immediate, but, but it's, it's straightforward now to, to see this ordering relation by using this uh, golden thompson inequality from before, okay? Because you see, the, the first two terms, they, they agree with all the expression. It's just the, 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 the second term or the third term but that we have to uh, take care of. And so we can bound this exponential here just by the product of the sigma and the omega in here by using this golden thompson inequality. And then there's also something called com complementary golden thompson inequality, where we can not only upper bound this sum here, but we can also lower bound it. Uh, but then we have to uh, look at this um, a matrix geometric mean. Okay, but it nicely fits actually with the quantities that appear here. Okay, good. Um, so we have these three quantities, commutative, Umegaki, Belavkin, Stasiewski. And now, yeah, ultimately, okay, this is also an abstract mass, so this is nice, um, but what are we really going to do? Um, okay, uh, so the right extension, as, as you all know, of course, is, is this definition goes back to, to Megaki, which we just call the, the quantum relative entropy nowadays, I, I, I would say. And uh, okay, so what we can do several things. We can look at, at operational problems, right? We can say like, okay, if we want to do like quantum data compression or, or things like that, and then, you know, a certain type of, uh, of entropy might show up. But, but one intuition I like, why, why this is the right quantity is, uh, is because of something uh, one might call a chain rule, or, or in the language I have been using is so this this omegaki relative entropy it actually generates the strong subadditivity, okay? So um, in, in in complete analogy to the classical case, uh, we can look at this relative entropy distance of rho ABC, and now here you remember before we had the uniform distribution, now it's just the maximally mixed state if you want, okay? Just the quantum analog of the uniform distribution, a tensor row BC, and then when we go to the right, we just forget about the last system, so now that's uh, the C system, and then it should never uh, go up. And these two inequalities are, are, uh, are really uh, equivalent, 
but only if you use this omega key definition. And uh, so there's also uh, some type of uh, axiomatic approach where you can uh, make this precise uh, if, if, if you want due to, to pets. Okay, uh, this is great. Um, so now, uh, forgetting uh, uh, again about all this abstract uh, stuff I, I told you, now we're just going to work with this omega key quantity. Okay, we, we established this is the right quantity. Um, so now we want to study this, this quantity because this is how we study quantum entropy, right? Uh, now, I told you that this, this strong subadditivity is, is the one uh, basic inequality from which all the other mathematical properties follow. And it turns out that, well, this inequality is equivalent to something which might at first look a bit more general, which is again the monotonicity of the relative entropy. Okay? So again, if we have the relative entropy in rho and sigma, if you apply a quantum channel, it will never go up. Okay? So this is now the basic property. Um, of, of, of quantum entropy. And now, okay, so of course for this talk I want to understand this better. Yes, David, please. Yes. It's not elementary to see, but it's uh, one can uh, show it. And I think it also goes back to Lieb already, yes. Um, Yes, I mean, so this is, okay, so this is, uh, it's easy to see that this is, you want, it's, it's easier to see that this is equivalent to, to, to joint convexity uh, of the quantity. And, and then there is some, some clever trick to, to lift this inequality to show joint convexity of the function of, of the relative entropy. But I can tell you after, I'm interested in uh, more technical detail. Okay, so now I want to understand quantum entropy better, right? I want to do something in, in, in my talk. Um, so one thing that turned out to be very useful is actually look at the equality conditions uh, for of this kind of meta property of, of quantum entropy, okay? So the question is, when do we actually have equality here, okay? And uh, so there's a characterization of this uh, by, by Petz from 86. So wha wha what do we have here? Well, we are given two quantum states, rho and sigma. And uh, okay, this is just a support condition, so let's forget about it. And, and any channel that acts on, on this rho and sigma, then the, this relative entropy is, is a, a monotonicity, is, a, is an equality, uh, if and only if we have the following. Yeah, well, this might happen again, but okay. Yeah, maybe. Well, okay. Um, uh, if and only if we have the following, if there exists a channel, so R is another quantum channel, uh, that reverses this channel N on the particular inputs rho, okay, and sigma, sorry. So here we have N of rho, so if we apply this reverse channel, we get rho back. Here we have N of sigma, if we apply the same reverse channel, we get sigma back, okay. Now, of course, if this channel is like a unitary channel, this, this is always a trivial uh, to do, um, but in general, if you want to reverse some noisy quantum channel on two inputs with the same channel, so you want to reverse it with the same channel R, this is highly non-trivial. And, and the monotonicity of the relative entropy gives you an if and only if criteria when, when, when you can do that. Okay, so you can, and on one fixed input, you can always undo a noisy operation, but if you want to do it for two inputs simultaneously, this is, this is very, very uh, non and non-trivial. And, and you can just look at this relative entropy, you can compute this difference, and then you know uh, you, you can do it if and only if, if, if this difference is zero. Okay? And uh, okay, so this operation is, is, is not, not uh, unique, but you can write down uh, explicit expressions for it, and, and uh, importantly, it's independent of rho. Okay? So the, this actual algebraic expression for this channel will actually not uh, depend on rho. But let's just keep that in mind for, for later. Okay, and so then uh, now recently in, in, in quantum information theory there has been uh, this development where people looked at um, making these equality conditions stable. And stable in the sense that, okay, so what happens if, if the relative entropy only changes by epsilon, where epsilon is small, right? Do we then still have this recovery channel that undoes the noisy operation? at least up to error epsilon, okay? So that's what I mean by making this, this stable. So that's the, the, that's the question, and that would be a, a refinement uh, of this monotonicity statement, right? That we would also have uh, something like that, but, but only the proximate case, when, when it, it's allowed to, uh, to change a little bit. 
And, and when you try to do that, this actually uh, reveals a, a lot of structure about quantum entropy. And uh, okay, so here are all the, the state-of-the-art bounds. Um, I'll guide you through it, uh, uh, don't worry, okay? So, so we have the, uh, the first line here. So this is again, this is just the monotonicity of the relative entropy. And I'm telling you, okay, instead of this lower bound of zero, we can actually put better lower bounds, right? We can, and uh, in particular, we can put this bound one, two, or three. Um, but uh, somehow I think the nicest bound is, 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 is the second one, for, for reasons I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So let's just focus on the second one, okay? D don't look at one or three at the moment. So what does this bound now, uh, now tell you? Uh, okay, so first of all, this beta zero is just some probability distribution. So the exact structure, it doesn't matter, it's just if you uh, integrate it from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, it will integrate to one, okay? So it's a probability density if you you want and and uh, so what is this r well this r plays the role of this recovery channel from from the last slide okay so the again the exact form here doesn't doesn't really matter but the point is okay so the original channel went from h to h prime now this recovery channel is trying to undo the noisy operation so it goes from h prime back to h okay and now what can what can you see from this channel well so if you input n of sigma okay so if you try to undo the noisy operation um, on sigma. So if you input n of sigma, it's easy to see that this whole thing here uh, will collapse and will just give you back a sigma, okay? Uh, so why is that? Well, so here you have, if you put here, here an n of sigma, I mean, this is all the same operator, just to different power, but you can see this will all collapse then to an identity. And now this is the the adjoint map of the original channel. So adjoint, just in the standard uh, Hilbert-Schmidt in a product, but since the channel itself was a quantum channel, the adjoint of it will actually be unital, so that means it will preserve this identity in here. And then if you have a big identity in here, and then you again multiply it with this sigma, you see that these complex phases here will again vanish and we will just get a sigma back. Okay, so, so if, you, if you apply this recovery map to to n of sigma, it will always undo the noisy operation. Always, okay? However, uh, now let's look at this entropy inequality, okay? So here we have this difference of relative entropy, and we have this lower bound. Now, if this thing is only epsilon, okay? So if it only changes by epsilon, then you know that uh, this thing here is upper bounded by epsilon, right? And so that means that at least in this commutative relative entropy distance, okay, that means that the row is actually close to this state, okay? It's also going to be a state because it's the probability distribution. Um, so that means that if you apply this recovery operation now, okay, so instead of looking at this recovery operation for a fixed t, you can also look at this, um, this bigger operation where you average over all t's. And since it's the probability distribution, it's still going to be a, a valid quantum channel, okay? So if you apply this recovery map here to the n of rho, Okay, so it will also undo the noisy operation n on rho, right? Because the resulting state here will be close to rho if this whole thing is, is, is only um, given by epsilon, right? If so, if the relative entropy distance doesn't change much, only by epsilon, then you know that this term is upper bounded by epsilon. And this means that the rho is going to be uh, recovered, at least approximately, uh, by applying this recovery map. So you exactly get this behavior that we had on the last slide for the exact case. Yes, David. So this is what I, uh, well, depending on the time, uh, <laughs> um, I will uh, reveal uh, in the next slides. It comes from it comes from looking at matrix trace inequalities and looking at multivariate trace inequalities um, where this beta zero um, pops up. But actually, you can also write it differently. You don't have to write it in this form, um, but it is a unique type of, of uh, representation. So you cannot put other, another uh, uh, distribution here. In particular, if you would just look put t equal to zero, um, all these bounds, I think, are known to be wrong. So you really you kind of need this, this weird distribu distribution. Uh, but maybe I can convince you in a couple of slides from now that uh, this is a, um, 
this is the right thing to do, let's say. But okay, so here really the interpretation, not, not the exact form of this bounce is uh, important, but the interpretation of this, right? And that you, uh, if, if the relative entropy difference only changes by epsilon, then you have this recovery channel that undoes the noisy evolution on rho and sigma. Okay, and um, I'm not going to mention this. You can kind of uh, see that these three bounds are really um, incomparable, okay? So, but let's, let's maybe not talk about this. Let's just stick to this, uh, this, uh, this bound um, uh, for, for a second. And uh, yes, good. Um, now, there's a special case uh, uh, of this, which might be a bit easier to, to grasp, okay? So you can now apply this statement from the last slide to, to particular uh, states, rho and sigma, and to a particular channel, n, namely a partial trace channel. Uh, and then you can say something about uh, quantum Markov chains or approximate uh, quantum Markov chains. And uh, you might call this strong, strong subadditivity or yeah, whatever you prefer. Um, so okay, so here um, we're starting with the tripartite state again, so ABC, okay? Uh, and now I just put all these uh, terms from the strong subadditivity statement on one side, okay? So remember this was lower bounded by, by this, right, with, with a plus. Uh, but now I just shifted all the term on one side and then actually this, this linear combination of entropies people sometimes call um, a quantum conditional mutual information. Uh, okay, now if you apply the, the theorem from before, we can actually see that now this uh, quantum conditional mutual information uh, is lower bounded by, by this term, okay? So now what does uh, this, this term uh, say? Well, now let's um, again think uh, that this, this term here, that strong subadditivity, is fulfilled up to uh, some small epsilon, okay? So that by losing uh, the, the system, it only changes, uh, sorry, I, I should rephrase that. So, so I want to assume now that the conditional information is smaller than epsilon, okay? So this entropy difference is, is very small. So what does that tell you about the structure of the state rho ABC to start with? So what it tells you is now that this term here is upper bounded by epsilon, right? And again, at least in this uh, commutative relative entropy distance, this means that the rho ABC um, is close to this recovered uh, state here. Um, okay, <coughs> so let's see if I have something. No, no, this is for uh, in a second. So, so what this uh, what this means here is that you can iteratively build up uh, your state again. Okay, so you can see. So, if this condition information is small, uh, you can start with only the row AB, so the reduced state only on AB, not ABC, only AB, and then you apply a map which only acts non-trivially on B. And you again recover the full state. So you go from AB to ABC again with only this local map. And in general, if you have a row ABC which is entangled, this is not possible. Um, however, it is possible if the conditional mutual information of the state is small. Okay, if strong subadditivity is fulfilled with near um, equality. And, and this is what this, this theorem shows. So again, the, the exact form of the bound might not be uh, super crucial. Um, what the interpretation is, okay? Yes, please. Uh, the smallest. And it's wrong if you want to replace it with the D or the, the D Belavkin, you really have to uh, use this one. And I might also say that classically, this is actually an equality. So, but then if you want to go to non-commutative case, we know now that you have to go to this the smallest possible non-commutative chance. Um, but of course, you can also go to a fidelity bound again, right? If I go back, you can maybe you pick this bound because it's actually, uh, you know, the fidelity is a nice type of distance measure. But if you want to stick with the rel some relative entropy type of distance measure and you want to kind of reproduce something that's tight in the commutative case, you have to write this commutative. Okay, so, and uh, actually this whole development here uh, goes back to, to work of um, Omar and, 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 and Renato, and then um, man, many, many more papers, man, man, many improvements. I can't give all the references here. Um, but my point here is that if you want to get these, these tight theorems, okay, um, if you want to have this full understanding of what's happening, you actually need the matrix analysis. You need the multivariate uh, trace inequalities. So in particular, I will, I will write you down uh, one matrix trace inequality of Golden Thompson type from which all of this follows immediately. Okay. 
good. Um, so let's uh, let's do that. Um, but to do that, let's uh, first look at the original proof of strong subadditivity. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the strong subadditivity case for now. I'm not going to go into relative entropy at this uh, distance in, in general. Um, but let's look at the original proof. Okay, so this conditional mutual information, this linear combination of, of entropies, it's actually very uh, it's simple to see that you can write it as a relative entropy distance between the original row ABC and then the, uh, a bit of a weird operator, okay, where you put the exp of the logs of these logs. Okay? But if you just write out the definitions, you see that this is trivially um, equal. And of course, exp is a, it's a positive function, right? so this is going to be a positive operator here. Uh, and then there is a very simple uh, inequality, uh, sometimes uh, called uh, uh, Klein's inequality, which just tells you that the relative entropy is lower bounded um, by the difference of the traces of the argument. Okay, so this is at least a semi-elementary argument, which I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into more. But now you can see, um, if you do this, then you get a lower bound of zero here. Already now, if you can show that this exponential operator here is subnormalized, right? If the trace of this is smaller than one, then this will be lower bounded by zero. And this is exactly where where leaps uh, triple matrix inequality, this three matrix extension of the golden Thompson inequality kicks in. Uh, namely, uh, if you look at this, the trace of the exp of log m1 plus m2 plus m3, right? Uh, then, I mean, I had this on my second slide. I think this is upper bounded uh, by this a bit cumbersome um, integral expression. Right? But now we, we, we're just going to use this, we just plug it in um, well for the right operators, right? So now we have these three operators here, okay? So now it, it matters which one we choose M1, which one we choose M2 and M3 because right, th there's a particular ordering we have here. Um, but we can just choose M1 to be row AB, M2 to be the, the row B to the minus 1, okay? So okay, I take the inverse of a density operator, um, it has full support, it's fine, otherwise we can play some tricks. So it's just imagine it has full support on, on row B. And uh, M3 we take row ABC, okay? So if you look at this expression, um, now you see the only operator that depends on A is, is the M1, right? Okay, so to be precise, of course, I should tensor this row AB with an identity on A and C as well, right? Because we're acting on the same space. But, but the point is, the only operator that depends non-trivial on A now is the first one. So that means we can just take the partial trace. So here we have a full trace. But now, since only M1 depends on A non-trivially, we can take the partial trace. And then this becomes a row B, right? And then this row B actually kills this row B to the minus ones, right? Because now it's, well it, it, it all commutes and we can take it, take it together. So we can take this M1, it's now a row B. This is a row B, row B, we can take those together. And then, since these are the only ones that depend on lambda, we can just do a, a scalar integration. Uh, and then, what we end up here is 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 one. Okay, so we really get an upper bound, get an upper bound uh, uh, of one. Because if we now this this the m1 m and m2 terms, if we do this scalar integration, uh, they will just give us an identity, and then all we're left with is trace of m3. But m3 is of course just rho bc. Okay, so, so if, if you didn't follow all, all the details, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, but now comes kind of the punchline, what we have to do. So if we now try to um, prove this stronger, strong subadditivity, okay, we can do the first step again. It's an equality, we don't lose anything. But then already the second step here, this is known to be a very non-tight bound in general, this client's inequality. So we do something different. Namely, we, uh, we use this variational expression is Legendre transformation of, of, of the relative entropy function. Okay, because now, okay, so I just plugged it in, the one I had it on, on my slides uh, before, because now we have these two terms, and now we separated the row dependence from the dependence on this exponential operator. Okay, so the first term is just trace uh, rho log omega, fine, but now the second term is, uh, is this. Okay, so we have the logs from before, and now we have an, an additional, a fourth term, a log uh, omega ABC, which comes from this optimization. Okay. But now you see, okay, because if we work in this picture, we actually need a four matrix extension of the golden Thompson to, uh, to work with this, because now we have four terms. 
Okay, so now the, the whole point of this is that we can actually derive uh, a four matrix extension of the golden Thompson inequality or, or even an N matrix extension. Okay, so remember that the, the two matrix golden Thompson was just that we could upper bound the, the sum here with this product. Right. And now I'm, I'm going to do the same. Okay, it's a bit, bit more general here. But as you can see, basically here we have a, an exponential of a sum of many Hermitian operators. And here on the right hand side, I have the, a product of exponentials, right? So it has the same structure as the original Gordon Thompson. And now here, okay, so you can do this not only for the trace function, so here we have the trace function, right? But you can do this for any, uh, these are just uh, Shatton P norms, or you can actually do it for any unitarily invariant norm. Uh, but let's just think of it basically as a trace around it. Um, okay, <coughs> and then this, this theorem really tells you, um, yeah, you can do this Gordon Thompson step um, where you re, um, bound this exponential of sum as uh, with a product of exponential. Um, now, of course, this comes as a price. So, for example, this beta zero distribution comes in, and you see you have these convex phases here. So, here it's plus i t, and then you have to integrate over all these t's. And I think it might be uh, helpful um, to compare this with uh, Leap's triple matrix inequality, right? Because it didn't have this form. So now, if we if we uh, specialize this form here. Um, to three matrices, remember the Lieb inequality was for three, and then we take the p equal two shot norm, okay, because this actually corresponds to the trace. So then if you, if you look at this theorem, um, it simplifies, so we also want to get rid of the logs, which we can do, since log is a concave function, and we can use Jensen's inequality, and then we end up at this, okay? Um, so on the left-hand side, the normal expression, x of h, 1 plus h2 plus h3, but on the right-hand side, uh, we now have this kind of, uh, well, if you want, ugly um, sandwiching here with these convex phases. However, it turns out, and this is really just uh, by kind of brute force calculation by hand, that these integrals are exactly the same. Okay, And so you have this, um, this representation here of, of leap, but these integrals, if you, if you calculate them, they're actually the same. Um, okay. Now the point is that leaps bound here, it doesn't extend from three to more matrices. It's unclear. But if you rewrite leaps bound in this form with this beta zero distribution, then as we show, it nicely um, generalizes to n matrices. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the main theorem. Uh, now um, I'm not going to prove it because I'm running uh, out of time and probably not necessarily super interested in, in, in the proof. I'm just going to say one thing. So there's actually something a little more general. Uh, which is a, a multivariate version of uh, so-called araki leap tiering inequality. So this is just if you look at the, instead of the exponential function, you look, uh, look at the, a power function. Okay, so here, the left-hand side, you, you have the product of these operators to the power r, and then you have a global power, 1 over r. And then you can bound this with something where you take this global power now inside on the individual matrices, right? And then it vanishes. So here there is no r anymore. And the nice thing is about this is that by uh, this Lee, Tr uh, Lee Trotter expansion, if you look at this inequality and now you let r going to zero, you get back by this well-known basic identity, you get back the Golden Thompson version. Okay, um, so the exponential function is sometimes not so so nice to work with. So it's better to work with these power functions, and then get the exponential statement back in this Lee Trotter limit of r going to zero. And now, okay, so you can play this game further and now look at, okay, we look at any trace inequalities to, uh, that you like and try to generalize it to, to multiple uh, matrices. Um, but let's, uh, le let's not do that. Uh, let's also um, uh, skip the proof. So the proofs are, are based off, uh, on uh, complex interpolation uh, theory and it, they're actually it's very elegant, and I think, and uh, uh, very nice. And uh, so, yeah. Yes, this is so. If I just for David lose like a minute or two on this, um, so the point is that you usually uh, so they have this Hadam Hadamard's three line theorem, which tells you that if you have a, a uniformly bounded and holomorphic function on this convex uh, strip, right, uh, then the value of this function on the on the real line is controlled uh, by the value of the function just on the boundary of this strip. Okay, this is this Hadamard's three line theorem. Now the point is you can 
you can either, this is the version that people usually know, you can either just look at the, the largest value on the left uh, boundary of the strip and the largest value of, of the, on the right boundary of the strip, and then you get an upper bound here. Uh, but if you want to make this more precise, uh, you can actually uh, kind of look at the, the whole boundary and weight it with some, with some function, this, this beta function. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have a, a very good understanding of this, I guess, um, but this is where it, it, it comes from, basically. Good. Um, so then this is, the proof is very short. This is the whole proof, um, but let's not, uh, uh, let's not do it. Um, let's come back to conclude here uh, to the actual entropy inequalities, right? So now we have this n matrix extension, and uh, now we needed it for four matrices, so I'm going to choose n equal to four, and again, I'm like in Leap's case, I'm going to choose the norm to be this Schatten 2 norm. And then you can see that the inequality, this general theorem I gave you, this actually gives you this upper bound, okay? So you have this exponential of the sum of these four matrices and you can get an upper bound like this. So let's plug it in, okay? So this is just the calculation from before. So I wrote this conditional mutual information as this relative entropy distance of the row ABC and this exponential operator. I apply this variational formula, okay? So now I was left with this four matrix exponential term. Now I'm bounding this with this by just choosing the M1, M2, M3, M4 appropriately, okay? And then I get this upper bound here. But now the nice thing here that this resulting expression now is basically already this variational formula for this commutative relative entropy distance, okay? Because now you see in this, okay, I don't know if, if you remember the exact form, but for this commutative relative entropy distance, uh, the second trace term was just the optimizer, the omega, times some operator, okay? And this is exactly of this form. And now, this is already what I, what I set out to prove, right? So this is then the, this is the full proof. And actually by using, looking at, at small variations, you can, you can prove also the, the relative entropy bounds, you can prove um, this fidelity based bounds, you can prove everything from this, just this one inequality here. And that's also, yeah, that's why in all the bounds the beta zero comes up. Okay, great. Um, so I hope I could convince you that um, these trace inequalities are at the core of the mathematical properties of, of quantum entropy. And uh, so again, about uh, David's comment, uh, so we could ask if we can represent these beta zero a little differently, right? Um, so for the three matrix case, right, the leap had this, um, this representation in terms of the lambda. So, so mathematical physicists also call this, uh, the, 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 this type of bound, uh, it's in terms of a uh, resolvent, I think they call it. And now you can ask if in this n matrix case, okay, not only in these three matrix case, can you write it differently? Do you have to write these bounds in terms of the beta zero? And, and you don't have to. So you can also write it in terms of the uh, resolvent as, as shown uh, uh, by Marius Lem. Uh, it looks also a bit ugly, um, but you can do it. And you can, there is even this other uh, term bound which was useful for, for these, uh, these uh, guys because it's the integral is only of, of a bounded size. Okay? You see here we have minus infinity to plus infinity, we have zero to infinity. So you can re uh, kind of reparameterize it and, and, and put it back to a um, finite interval. Okay. And uh, yeah, so as I already hinted towards, you can now do a look at matrix analysis in general. And uh, people uh, recently started doing this now, where you try to uh, generalize matrix inequalities that you have for two matrices, not to n matrices. Okay? Um, again, let's not talk about this, but, but my punchline here is really that uh, virtually any property now you tell me anything you want to know about quantum entropy. I, it will follow from this n-matrix golden dumpster. Okay, so I think this is uh, kind of my, uh, my punchline. However, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just weaken it a bit by my outlook, uh, because now the question is, of course, okay, so now are there any new entropy inequalities we can show? In particular, entropy inequalities that we know hold in the classical case, can we lift them to the, the non-commutative setting? And so there's actually one entropy inequality which is a bit of a different type, Maybe it's also for the experts, um, but it's a different type of lower bound on the conditional mutual information, and it's actually not known how this bound is related uh, to these other bounds that I showed you. 
And that really puzzles me that I cannot find an elementary proof of this inequality. So this is a, it's a good open problem because, uh, okay, so I'm not going to tell you about these exact quantities, um, but to have a generic understanding of what's happening here might, would be very powerful because then maybe one could extend it slightly in different directions and this would imply very strong results in, in different fields of, of quantum information. Okay? Um, so this is a good open problem. Uh, and then, yeah, there are, many, there are many more good open problems. Um, so Okay, this all comes together. Um, so we could look at upper bounds on this function instead of lower bounds. Because remember, classically, this lower bound I showed you was actually inequality. We can look at this entropy type. So I'm here, I'm basically just listing stuff that we know are true classically, but we don't know uh, quantumly. So, so these two things are actually open. Where this one, there is a very cumbersome proof that one should simplify. And yeah, and then you can apply all of these things uh, to problems in quantum information theory. And this is really the, 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 full, the full spectrum of, of, of quantum information theory. I, I, unfortunately, I didn't mention any, any of the applications, but uh, there are some, some really nice ones. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Um, are there any questions that can be phrased on? Shoot. Yep. In the mic. 